Thank you very much, John. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted that you're here. Um, I was traveling recently in New Guinea, and I ran into a man who had three wives. And so I asked him, how many wives would you like to have? And there was this long pause, and I thought to myself, is he going to say five? Is he going to say 10? Is he going to say 25? And he leaned towards me, and he said, none. <laughs> <laughs> Eighty-six percent of world cultures permit a man to have several wives, but in the vast majority of them, only about five or ten percent of men actually do have uh, more than one wife. Co-wives fight. Uh, they'll even poison each other's children. Uh, the human animal is not built to share. Uh, you have to have a lot of goats, or a lot of cows, or a lot of land, or a lot of money uh, to build a harem. We are basically a species that forms pair bonds, monogamy, mono meaning one, gamma meaning spouse, one spouse. We're also adulterous. In fact, in nature, you often see whenever there is monogamy or pair bonding, you also see adultery. They go hand in hand. So I do think that one of the biggest uh, 21st century issues is going to be um, the way each one of us decides to balance our drive uh, uh, to commit and our drive for autonomy. I think those are the two great, um, one of the great problems of this century. I began um, several years ago to try to understand the human reproductive strategy, human mating habits. I and my colleagues have now put over 100 people into a brain scanner. Uh, the first uh, 17 were people who were happily in love. The next were 15 people who had just been rejected in love. And the third group, major group, were people who were in love long term. And we found activity. First of all, this is our brain scanning study. Uh, you can't get two people in a brain scanner. Uh, uh, the New Yorker seemed to think so. Uh, this is what the scanner actually looks like. And in fact, uh, we found in all of our studies activity in a tiny little factory near the base of the brain called the ventral tegmental area. And this is a brain region that actually makes dopamine, a natural stimulant, and sprays it to many brain regions um, uh, that gives you the elation, uh, the focus, the energy, the possessiveness, the motivation, and the craving for another human being. I study poetry. I think it is one of the great artifacts of the human mind. And everywhere in the world, people talk about love. And I think of all of the poems, uh, quotes from about romantic love. Perhaps the very finest was done by Plato in the symposium when he said, the god of love lives in a state of need. It is a need. It is a craving. It is a homeostatic imbalance. It is a motivation, a motivation system that evolved millions of years ago to win life's greatest prize, which was a mating partner. So um, I want to show you some of my newest slides on that made by my brain scanning partner, Lucy Brown. Uh, this is the parts of the brain uh, that is the most primitive, uh, the reptilian brain. Uh, and romantic love, the, the, the VTA is right around there. This is where all the survival mechanisms uh, are orchestrated, thirst and hunger and romantic love. It's as powerful as thirst and hunger. It lies right next to a brain region linked with the sex drive. It's not in the same area. Uh, the, the sex drive really emanates from the hypothalamus, but it's right next door. And I think what happens is the sex drive evolves to get you out there looking for a whole range of partners. I mean, you can have sex with somebody you're certainly not in love with. You can think about sex when you're driving along in your car, reading a magazine, whatever. And I think the sex drive evolved to get you out there looking for a range of partners. And I think romantic love evolved to enable you to focus that mating energy on just one person at a time. The third brain system is attachment, is higher up in the brain. And I think together, these three brain systems orchestrate all of the nuances of all of the forms of love that we have for our children, for an idea even, uh, for, um, <clears throat> uh, for the cat or the dog, uh, and certainly uh, for a partner. So my first act of rebellion uh, is going to be against the drug industry. I've come to believe that we've evolved these three different brain systems for mating and, and reproduction, and they all um, are connected to each other. Uh, when you fall madly in love with somebody, dopamine goes up in the brain, that triggers the testosterone system, and all of a sudden, every single thing he or she does is cute, is sexy, is something that, you, that, you, that appeals to you. The ver reverse can be true, too. You can have casual sex with somebody, 
And indeed, uh, any kind of stimulation of the genitals will drive up the dopamine system, and you can fall in love with them. Also, uh, with orgasm, you can drive up uh, oxytocin and vasopressin and um, um, uh, trigger feelings of attachment. So casual sex is not casual, unless you're so drunk you can't remember it. It's not <laughs> casual. <laughs> Things are happening in the brain. And the bottom line is, oh, I'm going to go back. Uh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, the bottom line is um, the drug, drug industry these days is um, uh, dispensing 150 million prescriptions of, uh, of, of antidepressants annually. Uh, the vast majority of these are SSRIs uh, that drive up the serotonin system. And as you drive up the serotonin system, you're killing the sex drive. In 73% of, of patients, the sex drive is killed. And in fact, as you drive up the serotonin system, you're, a you're blunting the emotions, and you are driving down uh, the dopamine system. Now, there's some people who really need these pills. There's no question about it. They need these pills to get out of the bed uh, in, in the morning. But the bottom line is, um, psychiatrists now say that about 76% of people on these pills really don't need them. And so I wrote an article on this, on the relationship between these three brain systems that came out in a book by MIT Press. And in fact, I now get probably once a week a letter, much like the letter that I'm going to read to you now. It's the first time I've ever shown it. And here it goes. My husband was given an antidepressant, an SSRI, and now he is emotionless, no feeling. We are getting a divorce. I think the pills are to blame. It's like the film Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I just would say that we may be creating a vaccine for love. And in fact, that vaccine is, seems to be spreading around the world. And the drug industry, as of today, has never done, spent one nickel or done one study to see how these pills affect uh, these three brain systems, they know it affects the sex drive, but they have no idea yet how they uh, 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 affect the systems of romantic love and attachment. And these brain systems are the very core of human sexual and social and reproductive life. My second rebellion is against um, the definition of addiction. I've long thought that uh, romantic love was an addiction, a perfectly wonderful addiction when it's going well, and a perfectly horrible addiction when it's going poorly. And so after doing my first brain study, which was very popular in the press, I did a second one on rejection and love. It's much more important to me. Uh, and in fact, my hypothesis was that this really was an addiction. It's got all of the characteristics of addiction. I'm not going to go through with them. Uh, but the bottom line is I then started this study by putting a flyer up around uh, New Jersey, Red Cruz, where I'm from, uh, uh, New York City, um, uh, parts of Long Island, et cetera. And it said, um, have you just been rejected but can't let go? And in fact, we got all kinds of people, a very difficult study for me because, oh boy, these people are so depressed. <laughs> and I put them in the, <laughs> I'm not a psychologist, and I, some of them I had to go into their bedroom and get them out of bed. They'd been in bed for three days. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I put them in the machine, and this is what I was looking for, activity in a tiny little factory called the nucleus accumbens. It's a brain region that, is, that becomes activated in every single addiction. This whole reward system, the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus accumbens, and this whole brain system for wanting became activated among these people who had been rejected in love. And in fact, the same brain system becomes activated uh, when you t uh, are craving cocaine, heroin, amphetamines, food, gambling, sex, all of the uh, non-substance addictions, et cetera. This, we've proven it in the brain that this is an addiction. I'm not suggesting that we put it into the dia diagnostic and statistical manual for various uh, reasons, but I do think that it would be appropriate uh, to treat it as an addiction uh, and, and act accordingly. So, uh, in fact, I would suggest that all of these brain systems, all three of them, can turn into a very negative addiction. And in fact, my guess is that this basic, these basic brain systems that evolved for romance and attachment and sex are now being hijacked by the other uh, uh, the, uh, uh, drugs of abuse, uh, but that they evolved millions of years ago, of, cor of course, for courtship and reproduction. So. 
Um, I think George Bernard Shaw has it right. You know, I was just trying to think as I was preparing for this, how many people are, are in jail for drinking too much? You know, how many people are in jail for eating too much? I think that uh, George Bernard Shaw summed it up and he said, um, uh, when we want to read of the deeds of love, whither do we turn? To the murder column. Uh, it's a basically, we're talking about one of the most powerful addictions the human animal uh, has ever experienced. And, and the bottom line is just about everybody has experienced it at some point. I mean, nobody gets out of love alive. We all get, get screwed at some point, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> These evolved a long time ago. They're going to be with us a million years from now. And in the state of rebellion, uh, one really should find out what goes on with these brain systems uh, when you drink too much, when you take drugs, when you have exercise, what th things that you eat. We know nothing about how our environment affects these three basic brain systems for mating and reproduction, one of the most powerful parts of our lives. So on to something happier. Um, I stumbled on this, we stumbled on this. I and my brain scanning partners, Lucy Brown, Art Aaron, and Bianca Acevedo. Uh, Bianca had um, gone in to take a look at uh, romantic love among older people. And you can remain in love, not just loving, but in love long term. Uh, and then another one of our colleagues, uh, Mona Zhu, went to China to reproduce the experiment. When you're studying something for the first time, you've got to do it over and over and over in different parts of the world. And sure enough, we stumbled on the three brain regions that become active among people who are in a long-term happy relationship. You know, there's so many psychological studies of what makes happiness. Well, learn to argue properly, learn to listen properly. It's all about your childhood, it's all those, and those are all fine. I'm not in rebellion against them, but I want to add to the, the, uh, the, 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 the research on this by showing what happens in the brain when you are happily in love. And these are the three things that we stumbled on and found. One thing is these people have real empathy for their partner. The second is that they're able to control their stress uh, and control their emotions. And the third thing is what we call in academia positive illusions, the simple ability to overlook what you don't like about them <laughs> and focus <laughs> on what you do. <laughs> And I'll just, I'm afraid I'll go over by saying this, but I'll give you a perfect example. I went out for many years with a man who was so slow. Oh, God, he was so slow. He walked slowly. He talked slowly. He thought slowly. He was a brilliant man, but he was slow. And, <laughs> but, you know, when we went to the Metropolitan Museum in New York, he would look at a picture for so long and then talk to me about it. When we read a book together, he would talk about it. Uh, when we went to the theater or to a documentary, he would talk about it at great lengths. And I learned that even though I was walking like this because it was so slow, uh, <laughs> I, I, I learned to say, OK, he's slow in the street, but he's, his, he's very interesting. So this whole bottom thing of making lemons out of, uh, making, turning lemons into lemonade, and we have a whole part of the brain that is activated when you're able to do that, and it is associated uh, with long-term love. So. You got to pick the right person. And um, so why him, why her? This began for me um, in 2005. Uh, it was a couple days before Christmas. Uh, I live in New York City. Nothing happens two days before Christmas. And Match.com gave me a call. And they said, can you come in right two days after Christmas? And I said, well, sure, I guess. And I walked in, and uh, they, all these people piled in. and. Couldn't figure out who anybody was, and as it turned out, it was the CEO on down. And they ended up saying to me in the middle of the morning, why do you fall in love with one person rather than another? And I said, I don't know. And nobody knows. <laughs> we do know that um, you tend to fall in love with somebody from the same socioeconomic background. Timing is important. Proximity is important. I would add, actually, lighting can be important <laughs> as you get older. <laughs> Uh, your ethnic, you know, we tend to fall for somebody from your same ethnic background, same socioeconomic background, same level of intelligence, good looks and education, religious and social uh, values make a difference. Your childhood makes a difference. I call it your love map. Uh, we create an unconscious list of what we're looking for uh, as we um, grow up. But you can walk into a room and everybody is from your background and same level of education and good looks, and you don't fall in love with all of them. So I began to think to myself, 
Maybe there's biology. Maybe we're naturally pulled to some people rather than others. People will say, well, we had chemistry, or we didn't have chemistry. So I thought to myself, ah, I'm going to see if I can't figure this one out. So I went home, and I went through the biological literature, and I came, I was looking for any trait linked with any biological system at all. There's all kinds of systems in the brain that keep the eyes blinking and the heart beating, but they're not linked with personality traits. So I, I, I assembled a group of, a constellation of personality traits linked with these four brain systems, the dopamine, serotonin, testosterone, and estrogen system. If there had been six, I would have put six. If there had been 10, I, would, I only found four. So I'm going to go very rapidly through the, the biologically based traits linked with each one of these systems. I created a questionnaire to measure the degree to which you express all of these systems. Nobody expresses just one. Uh, in fact, I did a study with 100,000 people, and no two people took my questionnaire the same way. I've, n I've never met two people who are alike. I'm an identical twin. We're not alike. No two people on this planet are alike. But there's patterns to culture, there's patterns to nature, and there's patterns to personality. And so I want to go very rapidly through these four broad styles of thinking and behaving, and then <clears throat> show you who's naturally drawn to whom. And uh, 13 million people have now taken this questionnaire. It's big data, and uh, I, I, I'm overwhelmed with the amount of, uh, of work it, uh, 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 of data that we've, we're collecting uh, regularly about love. So the very first of the types are a high dopamine type of human being. I call them the explorer. Not a great term. I've got some academic terms which I won't bore you with. These people are born free. Um, they're novelty seeking, risk taking. It's called sensation seeking. Uh, they're curious. They've got the most interests. Uh, they make the most money. They lose the most money. Uh, they um, uh, tend to be energetic, restless, exploring, not just uh, jumping off of bridges or climbing mountains, but intellectual exploration. I would imagine that the vast majority of people in this room are very high dopamine uh, people. Enthusiastic, optimistic. Uh, independent, self-reliant, uh, impulsive, uh, spontaneously generous, uh, mentally flexible, open-minded, tend to be much more democratic, actually, and idea generation. It's a very uh, uh, important aspect of the dopamine system, just being creative. A good example, I think, Richard Branson, I've always thought rules were made to be broken, spoken like a true explorer. Uh, Lang Lang, the um, concert pianist, flair, dazzling, charisma, bravado, daredevil, extremes, ebullient, take them by storm, very much of the high dopamine type of man. And I got permission from, from her <laughs> to put that slide in, um, but very much of a high dopamine uh, person. Uh, uses very imp interesting words, impossible, inevitable, surprise, possibilities, creating new, and you can't lose your nerve, a risk taker to the bone. They're very different people. They have very different interests. They've done very different things in the world, but the temperament, the biology is the same. They also go for people like themselves. Might not end up with somebody like themselves, but their first response is to find somebody who's just as curious, creative, and spontaneous as they are. Uh, the second type I call the pillars of society, builders, lousy term, I'm stuck with it now. People are very expressive <laughs> of the serotonin system. Uh, Plato called them guardians. A lot of these people, uh, Plato, uh, Carl Jung, uh, Myers-Briggs, intuitively have figured out these four styles. What I'm really adding is just the biology to it. Uh, they tend to, uh, they like the familiar. They, they, they follow social norms. We really have the genetics of that. Uh, this, no, they're not scared, they're cautious, they ha what they call harm avoidant, they're calm. That's why you take Prozac or Paxil uh, to be calm. Uh, <laughs> These people are naturals at it. Uh, <laughs> plans, routines, schedules, orderly, sustained attempt, concrete thinking. They're literal. Uh, they do not like the theoretical. Very good with numbers, um, want to belong, importance of belonging. Follow the rules. They tend to be more religious. They also tend to be much more Republican. Uh, you know, I got 13 million of these things. You can ask them a million all these questions. So uh, I'm getting more and more understanding of this personality style. They're loyal. 
It's interesting, of all the questions, mathematically this comes up over and over and over for me. I can't remember quite what the question is on the questionnaire, but it's something like, would you rather have loyal friends or interesting friends? Well, we all want loyal friends, and we all want interesting friends, but this type can't tolerate unloyal friends, and the other three types cannot tolerate uninteresting friends. It's really a mathematical uh, <laughs> difference. Um, a good example is uh, Meg Whitman. I'm really interested in reading all these biographies. I did a linguistic study with 178,000 people. They use the word values. Uh, uh, she's very high on the serotonin scale. Mitt Romney is a ringer for a high, high serotonin <laughs> type builder. Uh, and Hu Jintao, the, the former uh, chair, uh, the president of, of China. I haven't studied the, the newest one, uh, but he's very high in the, on the serotonin scale. And it's very interesting, the particular gene for social norm conformity is most prevalent today in China and Japan. So we're going to begin to be able to map almost personality styles of, of whole countries and why people escape countries, leave countries, in order to go to a high dopamine country, uh, for example. The third of these, oh, they go, they go for people like themselves. Traditional goes for traditional. Just the way uh, creative, curious, spontaneous goes for people like themselves. Uh, the third type is high testosterone type. They understand rule-based systems, math, engineering, computers, music. They really see the structure of music. I don't. I swing to the beat. But uh, these people know the structure uh, of music. Beethoven, I think, was a perfect example. Very analytical, logical. Um, experimental, exacting, daring, rank-oriented, uh, competitive. In fact, if you inject testosterone into a dove or a, or a lizard or a monkey, they'll begin to fight uh, for rank. Uh, middle-aged uh, women, as estrogen levels go down, it unmasks levels of testosterone, and middle-aged women can become uh, more assertive. Um, they, um, they're emotionally contained. I have, a, I have a girlfriend who, she said to her husband, she said to him, she said, sweetie, I, you haven't told me that you loved me in a month. And he said, well, I said that last month, and nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> it's contained. Uh, decisive, bold, and these are the ones that scream, get to the point. A good example is uh, Steve Jobs. You can see the testosterone. This is the way the brow ridges are built, the very high forehead, the zygomatic arch, the high cheekbones, and the very square jaw is all a very high testosterone fellow, demanding, brutally honest, prickly, brash, impatient, self-disciplined uh, uh, fellow. Hillary Clinton, I think, is a woman who's very high uh, testosterone. Uh, when asked why uh, she was attracted to Bill, she said, he wasn't afraid of me. <laughs> you think we're having a woman president? <laughs> And they go for their opposite. Uh, uh, I've done two studies of 40,000 people. They tend to go for their opposite. And the opposite is uh, what I call the negotiator. Uh, Plato called them a philosopher king. They're very expressive of the estrogen system. They see the big picture. I coined this term, web thinking. Uh, they are imaginative, mentally flexible, tolerate ambiguity, really good uh, with language skills, reading posture, gesture, uh, tone of voice. Um, theory of mind, uh, being intuitive, we now know the biology of that. It's a real thing. Women, on average, are better at it, and it does make you more successful in business. Um, trusting. It's a trusting is an interesting one for me as an anthropologist, because people who are trusting, um, you waste a lot of metabolic energy if you trust the wrong person. So, but the bottom line is, if you can read their mind and watch their posture and gestures, you're more likely to get the right person and save a lot of metabolic energy. So you can begin to see how these things would evolve together. Uh, they tend to, everything has meaning for them. Just the way you cut that lemon means you, you were mad at me for something. It's just, you know, it, everything has meaning for them. Uh, uh, they seek harmony. They'll never hit you in the face, stab you in the back. Uh, emotionally expressive, and a diplomatic intelligence. A good example is Oprah Winfrey and Bill Clinton. He's got a synthesizing mind. Whole world knows he can't stop talking. His book's 168 page, uh, 968 pages. Emotionally expressive. He feels everybody's pain. <laughs> you know, Americans are wondering when we're going to have our first female president. I think we've had our first female <laughs> president. <laughs> Uh, 
as I say, I got 13 million of these zip codes. And uh, all the serotonin people, the uh, traditional, are congregated in the middle of the country. They're also very Republican. Testosterone congregates around Washington, D.C., trying to run the world. Or they're out gambling in Las Vegas, that's very spatial. Or they're in Alaska shooting the animals, that's all high testosterone. <laughs> Everything that's loose runs into California. That's high dopamine. Uh, and the high estrogen types congregate on the two uh, very, very dem democratic parts of the nation where there's a lot of, a lot of colleges. So uh, we're beginning to map all of this. This is the most important slide for me. Uh, you don't have to read it. Um, but basically, and I'm, I'm, I'm being immodest, but um, to my knowledge, the questionnaire that I created is the first questionnaire to start from biology to make a questionnaire and then go back to the biology to prove that I'm measuring exactly what I'm measuring. And so I've decided to bring it to the business world. I'm not an entrepreneur of this variety. A young man came to me about five years ago and we're gonna start a consulting, we started a consulting business. It'll launch next year. And John, I don't need any money. He's on the second person who, scientist this week that doesn't need any money for it yet. Uh, to bring an understanding of these basic styles of thinking and behaving uh, to the business world. And um, actually, I've come to disagree with the golden rule, uh, treat your partner as you want to be treated. I think it's the platinum rule, treat somebody as they want to be treated. Understand who they are, treat them as who they are supposed, uh, the way they can hear you, and you will win. So, on to the future. I do an annual study with Match. Um, uh, we've got 25,000 people in it now. We do not poll the Match population. We poll the American population. It's a representative sample based on the US Census. And we're finding a whole lot of things about it. I only have a time for a tiny little bit of this. Um, and it will be coming out, actually, some of it in my next book. But uh, anyway, we're turning away. We're turning away from 10,000, for 10,000 years, you basically married the right girl from the right kin connection, from the right religious background, and the right ethnic back, uh, background, and hopefully from the, the farm next door. And indeed, we're turning away from all of that to marry for ourselves. Uh, uh, when I asked, what must you have in a relationship, must have or is very important to you, um, over 98% or 96% of both men and women, when men and women want somebody who respects me, trusts and confide, I can trust and confide in, makes me laugh, makes enough time for me, and is physically attractive to me. Look at the number of people who must have somebody of the same ethnic group and the same religion. It's way down. I think racism, uh, religious prejudice, and clanism, familyism, marrying for your family, are declining in America. Uh, they will, most of them say they're not going to marry. Uh, about 85% of men on average and women marry by uh, age 49. But this is a really telling thing to me. Uh, it's a study that came over my desk a few weeks ago and it, they looked at people who were living together and they said to them, you know, why aren't you marrying? And 67% of these cohabiting couples said they were scared of the social, legal, emotional, and economic consequences of divorce. And it began to explain for me a lot of my data because I came to believe that as a result, what we're seeing now is a, an expanding pre-commitment stage uh, of relationships. In fact, um, well, the one night stands, friends with benefits, living together, People say that this is all irresponsibility. My guess is that it's actually caution. That is, people who want to know everything about him or her uh, before they tie the knot. And one of the questions I ask every single year in this Singles America study is, um, have you ever had a one night stand that turned into a long-term partnership? And sure enough, a good 33% and 45% of people will say yes. So there's two ways to get the boy or the girl. Either you spend hours and days and months and years talking to him, getting to know him, or you get him into bed tonight and try and trigger these brain systems <laughs> for romantic love. You're then off to the races and you can get to know him in a state of, 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 of passion. <laughs> and I think, in fact, where marriage used to be the beginning of a relationship, now I think it is the finale. Uh, we're going to see new forms of marriage. Uh, 
And I think this is interesting. I, here's a real rebellion kind of thing. I mean, I, I wonder if we'll ever have a, get a license with an expiration date. <laughs> It would stop a lot of arguing, you know, you just wait, just wait for it to come. You don't have to <laughs> fight about it by point hand. <laughs> Makes some sense if you don't have children. Uh, I think we're going to see more happy marriages uh, because bad marriages can end with women piling into the job market in cultures around the world. Bad marriages can end. I know I'm talking a little bit over. I think I could be done in the next couple of minutes. Um, thank you. Uh, and so I wanted to see about happy marriages. So I, we did a study at Match.com of 1,000 people around the country, again, not certainly on the Match population, and uh, asked them a lot of questions. And one of the questions I asked was, um, would you remarry the person that you're married to now? And 81% said yes. And 75% said that they were still very much in love. I think as more and more women pile into the job market, we start having a double income family. People are not stuck economically together. Bad marriages can end, I'm not advocating it, leaving good marriages. We may be on the verge of seeing more happy marriages in the world today. Uh, uh, does technology destroy love? Boy, I tell you, I get more calls from the press on this. The answer is no. Uh, 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 the, uh, very definitely, it expands your dating pool. Uh, it helps you find people with your interests. Uh, anybody of any age can participate in their pajamas at midnight. I mean, this is civilized. Uh, and we're sure again, we're going to see all kinds of new courtship taboos and rules. Courtship is changing. But the bottom line is whether you meet them on Tinder or whether you meet them on Match or if you meet them on Facebook or you meet them on uh, Instagram, whatever, wherever it is, at some point you go in, you sit down, you have a cup of coffee, and at that point the ancient human brain starts to do its job. That brain has been around for 200,000 years. That brain has not changed for 200,000 years and it is not going to change because you clicked on Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> more about women. We think we know about women, but I don't think we do. <laughs> I think we, I, all of my data shows that they're very independent and actually extremely sexual, just as sexual as men. I think we, that's my favorite slide, just got it from a friend. Uh, I think we, I really don't think we understand anything about men. Um, and I have a lot of data showing they're just as romantic as women are. Uh, and I'm optimistic about the future, so I'm going to wind up with a couple slides here. For millions of years, we lived in little hunting and gathering groups. They were egalitarian, and women worked. They, they went off to work to gather their fruits and vegetables, just as men did. They came home with 60 to 80% of the evening meal. The double income family was the rule, and women were just as sexually and socially and economically powerful as men. We are moving forward to that kind of relationship. We are leaving behind 10,000 years of beliefs that a woman's place is in the home, that the man is the head of the family, that the man is the sole provider, virginity at marriage, till death do us part. It is just slipping away from us in these two generations, and we're moving forward to kinds of relationships that I'm very optimistic about. It, romantic love is becoming the core of our social lives. We're working harder on relationships than we really ever have. Uh, divorce rate is stable. We're seeing the rise of women. We're seeing more happy marriages. We have this long middle age, so if you don't get it right the first time, you've got a little more time at it. Uh, we've got all kinds of technologies, uh, Viagra, estrogen replacement, hip replacement, all kinds of things to, to get you out there. And we've got lots of tools to find love, not only Match.com, but, but all of the internet. So I will close with this. Any prediction of the future needs to take into account the most important determinant of the future, our unquenchable, adaptable, and primordial human drive to love. Thank you.